Thank you for the kind words, PJ. Uh, I'm not going to fool myself. I know you all are here for the brown box and not for me, but I'll tell you a little bit about me anyway, since I have your ear. Um, I've been doing video game stuff for a long time. I'm a lot older than I look. I got a baby face. Uh, to put some perspective on it, I think, I can't quantify it, but I think I started the video game rental business back in 84, renting ColecoVision games. So long before the Nintendo came out and everybody else was doing it. But that's a different story for a different night. Um, I've been teaching Kinesis for 10 years, game courses and some other courses. Uh, I used to have uh, a syndicated uh, newspaper column, Resonate, that I wrote for years. Um, been writing for magazines, and over the period of time I've met a lot of people. Uh, I, was, I did uh, helped on a TV show for MTV called Video Mods. It was on for two seasons in the mid-90s. And I've written a couple school textbooks, college textbooks. And I do a lot of magazines and articles. I'm still doing some. I have a couple columns uh, right now in Video Game Trader magazine, which I'll give a plug for. And they, they put me on the cover for the Guinness, too. So. And um, also for the new Kickstarter magazine called Retro. I have a column that's in it. But uh, I've been doing it for a long time. And one of my writing partners was Leonard Herman. Uh, I met him when I was uh, uh, writing for Classic Gamer Magazine. Sorry, it's been a while. I had to go backtrack. And uh, I've met him and some others. But Leonard's famous for writing the very first history book on video games. And there's been dozens since, but his is still the best. And while working with him, he kind of discovered Ralph Baer, which is why I'm here tonight, and wrote his history and wrote his story. He has a publishing group uh, called Rolenta Press, and he published Ralph Baer's book, which is floating around here somewhere, and I helped with this book as well. So Leonard introduced me to Ralph, and Ralph and I, I'm lucky to say, we've become friends over the years. He lives in New Hampshire. Uh, I go up every summer, and I've been in his basement, in his lab. We've actually worked on a couple projects together. We designed a toy together. But he's 92 years old, he's still alive, and he's still inventing things. And he's done a lot of things. We'll touch on some of that stuff tonight. But we want to go back in history and talk about some things that happened. Because there are a lot of things that happened that if it happened differently, video games would be totally different from what we know and live and enjoy and love today. Um, so let's rewind the clock. I'm a history teacher, so I got to get my history in. But 1922, Ralph Baer is born in Germany on the French border. Um, he grew up in Cologne and during Hitler's rise to power. And Ralph Baer, you might guess from his name, was Jewish. Um, so he was forced out of school at age 14. And um, you know, a lot of the Jews were being actively persecuted at that time. Uh, in 1938, he found himself, along with his family, in front of the consulate, trying to get to America. Uh, they didn't allow very many immigrants, but because they all spoke English and spoke it well, they were lucky to kind of win the lottery. And they came uh, to the United States. He arrived by boat, and just shortly after arriving in America was um, Crystal Night. I don't know, it's also known as the Night of Broken Glass, but that's a, a famous moment in history where a lot of the Jews were persecuted. There were coordinated attacks against the Jewish communities. Um, they burned over 1,000 synagogues, destroyed over 7,000 Jewish businesses, and rounded up over 30,000 Jews and put them in concentration camps. So while Ralph Baer was lucky, and his immediate family is lucky to get out. A lot of his family didn't. So now he's in the Bronx. He's got a job. He's working $12 an hour. Um, he's putting buttons on cosmetic cases, but he's really wanting to invent things. His mind's always turning and moving, right? So he comes up with his first invention at age 16, and it's a machine that um, speeds up the process of making leather goods. Not exactly technical or electronic, but you have to start somewhere, right? So, going back to work or doing a job, he's sitting on the subway. He's looking at the back of the magazine that the person beside him is holding, and there's an ad, and it says, make big money servicing radios, be a genuine radiotrician. So, he learned about it, he took the correspondence course, spent $1.25 every week out of his $12 salary, and uh, learned to work on radios. While he was working on the radios, uh, he listened to the news of the Blitz on London, in the invasion of Poland uh, by the Germans. In 1942, he gets drafted. So the war that he escaped from, he suddenly pulled back into it. Um, he's an engineer by mind and a tinkerer. And so in the service, he starts collecting weapons. 
right? Because what are guns? Complex mechanisms, right? And as Ralph Baer says, they're um, just fun to play with. So um, he'd learn how to take, them on, take apart the guns, clean them, learn how to recognize them, and he kind of became an expert. So Eisenhower sends him to Bristol, England, and he teaches uh, military intelligence. And while he's teaching military intelligence, he trains over 120,000 soldiers about weapons and other things that are important, such as how to recognize uniforms of the German armies, so you can tell you know, the different positions and ranks and how to act accordingly, uh, not just weapons. Um, he kept on inventing. He even fashioned an AM radio out of uh, German uh, mine detectors, which is an unusual use for a mine detector, to say the least. Um, he later gets out of the service, and courtesy of the GI Bill, he goes to Chicago and goes to college, and uh, comes out with a, uh, a Bachelor of Science degree in television engineering, which, you know, now that's not something we'd really go to school for, but in the time it was new, it was complex, it was a lot more sophisticated. Um, he has several engineering jobs after that at Wappler and Tribeca. He goes uh, to Laurel Electronics, and he later ends up as the chief engineer and vice president at Transitron. Um, while he's there, he's working on designing a new television. He's like building a television from scratch, right? And he's putting this together, and he decides that wouldn't it be great if there was a checkers game on your television? So he mentions it to his boss, this is 1951, and his boss looks at him and says, forget about it. You know, just build the damn TV set, you're already behind schedule. So the idea of the video games, 1951, it kind of popped into his head, but it sat idle and uh, dormant for another 15 years. Now we'll fast forward to 1966. Ralph's been a successful engineer for 30 years. Um, he oversees employees at Sanders and Associates, they're a military contractor. He's over 500 employees working underneath them. The problem is um, he's more of a manager and less of an inventor. You know, they're working on submarine warfare electronics and airborne radar, but he's not really inventing. So, one day, he's sitting on a concrete pad on a, on, a, on a cement step at a bus terminal. He's waiting for a fellow Sanders and Associates engineer to meet him. They're going to meet with a client, and Ralph has what he calls his eureka moment, right? When everything kind of uh, gels in his head. And uh, that's kind of the genesis of the industry. He's got a number two pencil and a yellow legal pad, and he writes down four pages of notes on his idea for what he calls Channel LP, which is short for Channel Let's Play. And it has typical game ideas that you would think, which seem common now, but remember, this is in the age of board games, right? So all the games that he's coming up with are sports games, or traditional board games, or card games, or art type of games. But he knows there's 40 million cathode ray tube TVs out there, and that there should be a use for them other than just watching television. So Ralph talks uh, to Sanders, Chief of Research and Development, Herb Campman, and Herb says, well, it's not typically what we do, but maybe we can work something where we can devise some type of training device for the military. So let's go with it. And so they give him $2,000 for research, $500 for parts. Now, $2,500 doesn't sound like a lot, but in 1966, it's enough money to buy a new car. It's a third of the average salary of the typical working man in America, and it's um, half the cost of the average home. So it's a good chunk of money. He pulls in two more Sanders associates, both by the name of Bill, Bill Harrison and Bill Roosh. One of them's an engineer, and the other one's an MIT student, or an MIT graduate. He's the one that has the idea of a machine-controlled ball moving around on the screen. Okay, and that becomes important. So they start working on the, what they call the TV games, the TV games box. Um, and they're trying to figure out, well, how do we get the signal to a television? Well, what you may not realize is that most of your game systems are actually tiny television transmitters. Right? They actually send out a signal. So at this time, they're going in through the... Um, you know, through the antenna terminals on channel three and four uh, to get the correct frequency. Um, the original used four vacuum tubes, no circuitry, no chips, you know, no transistors, very simple. But they were finally able to get a spot to move across the screen, right? So the first time the TV becomes the extension of a player. Um, they come up with different ideas. Um, on June 14th and 67, Bear goes to the store, buys a plastic gun from the toy store, Kmart or someplace, and puts a light mechanism inside, and the first light gun game is devised. It's on the brown box. We can't play it tonight, 
because it will not work through projection television, different technology, right? We've gone through a couple decades, but um, this is one of the guns. He also has a rifle that he made. Um, so it's the first light gun. Um, Campman's impressed. They have a meeting the following day with Sanders' uh, president. His name's Pope. Sanders' people look at it. They're not impressed. And the president says, build us something we can sell or we can license, right? So now Ralph Baer, you know, this command is kind of haunting him, right? So he's got to justify what they've been doing with this money. So they start making changes and additions. Like this is the brown box, and this is what's famous, but there are actually seven different iterations, and this is number six. And different things changed. Um, the early boxes on number two, they had a pump mechanism. And it literally, it's like a pump on a, on a fulcrum that you could pump, and they had like a firefighting game, and you're trying to pump the water through the fireman's hose onto the screen to put out a fire. It had a, one of them had a color wheel, kind of like a spinning wheel, kind of like you see on Wheel of Fortune, like traditional with some board games. Um, they added features such as velocity to help with the, the movement of the, the pixels and things on the screen. They designed a, a quiz light pen, so like it had a multiple choice question, you know, four choices, and you could just touch the screen, the box of the choice you want to pick, kind of like an interactive uh, Jeopardy. Um, they had planned a steering wheel. Uh, they had devised, kind of like in the facility we're in, a golf game with a golf putter, right? Um, so they're making all these changes, and uh, to make the games more real, they decide that they need to do overlays. So imagine on your television, you put this overlay up and it sticks, right? And the, and the light comes through the background because it makes it more real, right? You know, I remember as a kid, I used to have great joy. I lived in the South, so we always had our windows and doors open because it's, you know, hot. And the flies would fly into the home and they'd land on the front of the TV screen. They'd get stuck from the static electricity and they couldn't fly away. And as kids, we'd torture them, right? But, um, in this acid, it's the static electricity would actually hold the acetate to the monitor. So no messy tape or glue or staples or nails or anything like that you need to put into your monitor. So each game would have its own overlay. And uh, back then it seemed simpler because there were only two size televisions, right? They didn't have all the crazy different jumbo sizes that we have today. Um, so anyway, back to Ralph thinking, how do, how do we sell this? He says, you know, Sanders is not a defense contractor. We're not set up to manufacture it. You know, do we license it? And if so, who do we license it to? So Sanders wants a business plan, and Ralph doesn't have one, so he's feeling a little pressured. Right, this has been going on a long time, right? So then he kind of has another moment. He thinks, you know what? Most people are getting their television over the airwaves, right? But cable industry is around. It's been around since the 40s, so 20-something years, but still relatively small. Most of the people that are using cable television are because they live like in the valley, in a rural area where the mountains interfere with the signals. So they're using cable to actually get their television in. Well, Ralph Baer has the idea. He says, you know what? It could be a boom to the industry if we can allow them to supply, the cable company supply something that's unique. And TV games could be just the picture. So the idea was the cable satellite, the cable companies would broadcast a channel that would have tennis background, right? Or a hockey court. And you want to play that game, you go to that channel on your cable box, you turn on your TV games box, and it matches up. And then they could do, you know, more realistic things like uh, actual photographs, right? So whatever they wanted to hang up in the studio, point a camera app and, and, at and beam out. So they talked to Teleprompter. That was uh, the country's largest cable provider at the time. They said it's a go, and they start working on it, and then the recession kind of hits the, comp the company, the country, and it kind of kills the deal. They shop it around at Manhattan Cable. They talk to Warner Cable. They're all kind of excited, but a little iffy, and with the recession, no one actually does it. And so uh, it's tabled again. It's conceivable that if it had happened, you know, Teleprompter or Warner could be as important in the game industry now as, say, Sony or Microsoft is, right? Um, so cable's out, and Campman cuts off the funding. And TV games lies dormant again for a few more years. Time passes, technology changes, and, uh, you know, they decide to, you know, Bear decides to reconvince to bring this project back. And he does. So he gets back with Bill Harrison, they reduce the circuitry by half, and then they said, we need to dress this thing up so it looks nicer. So, 
We're up to TV box number six right now. Wood grain was pretty popular in the 70s. You might have grown up with a station wagon that your mom drove that uh, looked kind of like this. So they uh, go to the local Kmart and they get some shelf lining paper, wrap it around the box, and this becomes the brown box. That's how it got its name. Dressed up nice and pretty, right? If you want to pump the signal over, I'll introduce you to the first TV game. And I need someone to play with. Any volunteers? Come on up. What's your name? David. Thank you, David. Now, just like all the early video games, you kind of have to use your imagination a little bit. But, uh, you know, this is simply called chase. But conceivably, you know, it could be two submarines doing a classic hunt in the ocean, right? Oh, you figured it out. One thing you notice with the controller, Looks kind of like uh, with the exosketch, right? But there's actually a knob on the side. It's smarter than the exosketch because this is horizontal, moves you across, so you actually go left to right. The one on the side is vertical, so you're actually going up and down. Remember, as a kid, you'd have your exosketch and you kind of get confused because up and down was left and right, or was it right and left? You know what I'm saying, right? So this is smarter. It also has a button for English. We'll get into that sorter. But basically, this is a game of, of uh, catch here. So I'm sorry. What was your name again? David. David. I'm going to try to get you. Now, here's what's nice about this. You can hide off. There, he figured it out. You can hide off screen, right? So go somewhere and pop off. I'm going to get you. Okay. Uh, come on. Come here. I'm going to get you. Oh, he's, he's a natural. Come here. Man, you're the only person I've not been able to catch. Got him. Okay, there you go. Now push your button. Now, why don't you try to catch me? Peekaboo. Woohoo. Oh, and he gets it. Right, so that's the first game, playable on a television set. Obviously, there's no artificial intelligence, right? This is two players, two players only. Um, but there's different games in all the different modules. This one has seven games in it. The next logical thing, and I'm going to show you how I changed the games. There's dip switches in the back. And Ralph wrote a little note here and said, if I want to play the next game, which is Fox and Hounds, I need to put one up, two down, three up, four up, five down, six down, seven up, eight down, nine down, ten up, eleven down, everything else down. Now, I need another volunteer. Okay, so this is the Fox and the Hounds, right? He's the Fox, I'm the Hounds, he's purple, I'm white, I'm trying to catch him. Now, he has some advantages. He can leave the screen. I can't, right? I'm stuck on the screen, and he can move faster than I can. I'm just staying over here. Yeah, well, <laughs> you won't have much fun, but you can do that. See, if you're really skilled, you can weave through me. Why don't you try that? I won't move. No, push your button, you'll pop. Push your button, you'll pop back. I'm not ready you, for that. Yeah, you're not. You've you played this before. I know, but I wasn't. I was bad. So, oh, hounds. Hounds are going to get you. Hounds are going to get you. Here, you want to trade? You want to be the hounds? No. No? Whoa! The hounds didn't eat their Wheaties this morning. Gotcha. Okay, stay up here. So, this one ain't all for Who knows what this game is? What did I hear? Pong is wrong. <laughs> Pong is wrong. A gentleman named Nolan Bushnell started up Atari. Okay? When this was being, before it was released, it was being shown off at different places. And in Burlingame, California, which I think is funny because it has game in the word, right? Burlingame, California. Uh, the company, I don't want to ruin the surprise, I haven't got that part of the lecture yet. But the company that finally releases this is demonstrating this to the public because they can't really explain to people what a video game machine is because there's never been one before, right? So it's totally foreign. So they have these little presentations, and they're showing this. I'll push the button. Hold on. You're being recorded. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to slow it down. Push, push the button. Okay, Get, move, move up. Okay, there we go. And it's on slow now, right? So... Oh, we're on, we're on the wrong side. Switch sides. Switch sides. Now I can hit it. Okay. 
So, so they make this tennis game. Most of the original games came off of games in the real world, right? There weren't space invaders. The, the concept of aliens coming down and shooting them, blowing them up, it's, it's a foreign at that time. So they're mimicking games in the real world. You got chase, you have pong, or ping pong, you have tennis, you have hunting, right? Real world sports. So on the back of the brown box, I can push this button and speed it up. See, now we're going to go fast. Bam. Right, but anyway, Nolan Bushnell has had the idea of making games for a long time, but hasn't really actually done anything. They have a company called Atari. He's, a, he's one of the co-founders. He hears about this presentation. He's like, we didn't realize anybody was, was even in this industry, right? So he goes to the presentation. He sees this game, comes back, tells one of his students that he hired, Al Alcorn, to make a ping pong game, and it plays like this. For years, Nolan Bushnell denies that he saw this demonstration, right? Denied it for more than a decade, decade and a half. He said, we just have to have a similar idea, and Atari did it better. Well, that's all nice and fine until the guest book and the attendance log was found. And there in the book is Nolan Bushnell's signature and two of his employees at Ampex that came with him, right? So at uh, the Classic Gaming Expo in 2003, uh, Nolan Bushnell finally admitted that he actually did see Ralph Bear's uh, device and the ping pong game. But it wasn't very good, and it was made by an engineer, and they made improvements on it and made it a much better game. And he did add the ping sound, the pong sound, right? And if you notice, one thing I didn't show you, which is unique, I actually think it makes the game better, but in pong, you know, if the, if the ball hits the paddle at an angle, it'll bounce at an angle. Here, when you press, well, let me slow it down. Thank you. Let me get back. Where am I? I've lost myself. There I am. Okay. This other dial on the front. Okay. Bounce it back. Or, yeah, I can't show me the English. There's an English button. Make it go down. No. Okay. <laughs> Just knock it forward. Okay. Boom. Now it's going to come to me and watch what I can do. Woo. Whoa, it's crazy, right? There's a daub that, just like in a game of soccer or uh, tennis, you can hit the ball with some English. So after you hit it, you can use the third knob and kind of make it uh, a little swervy there, right? So when Bushnell and Atari put out, hey, put out Pong, you know, that feature wasn't there. And in their defense, it's kind of hard to play with three hands, right? Because you've got three knobs. But, that's good. thank you. The other game on here. I'm not done yet, are you kidding? Uh, one, I have a switch wrong. There's volleyball. Right? It's the same thing, but you got a little net in the center. And then there's hockey. Changed it to blue ice, right? And then you'd have your overlay to fill in the goal and stuff. You know, you got to keep score yourself. And then there's, well, there's the target shooting game, but all it does is put a pixel on the screen and you shoot it, but it won't work because this is not, this is a projection monitor, it's a different type of technology. But normally I'd go, bam, and it would disappear, right? And it'd pop someplace else. Well, actually, it's user controlled. So the second person would control the target. It can become a moving target as well. And you fire at it. Let's go back in time. How did this come out to be? So we played those games. They have a working box. It's now cheaper. It's, uh, originally, they wanted the game device to come out at $25. That isn't a reality. It ends up coming out at 100 um, but first we have to get this thing out. Ralph has to get this thing released. It's 1968. There's more than 100 TV manufacturers in the country. He calls every one of them. Okay? He finally gets a reply and interest from RCA. They say their serious negotiations have begun. They're talking about it, what they're going to do. And then they're delaying and they're laying and the contract never shows up and the contract doesn't get there. Finally the contract shows up. And Ettlinger says, it's no good. And Bear says, what do you mean? And Ettlinger says, it leaves Sanders with next to nothing. And Bear says, so that's it, then? He says, that's it. And TV Games dies again. 
and um, goes dormant. However, in time, one of RCA's employees leaves RCA and um, uh, goes to Magnavox. And he becomes the vice president at Magnavox. And of course, he's new. He's wanting to prove himself. He talks about this amazing device that he saw and that it should be a Magnavox product. And that's basically what happens. Magnavox releases the Odyssey, which we'll look at in a second. But before that, they have to have the meeting. So they're in uh, Indiana, Fort Wayne. They're having a meeting. Ralph Bell gets there. Indiana is under a state of emergency. They just had flooding, intense storms, and he's wondering if maybe this is another bad omen because this thing never seems to get off the ground. He's doing his presentation. All the executives in the room seem very bored. They're all disinterested, except for one, Gary Martin, the RCA employee that went to Magnavox and invited him in for the presentation. After the presentation's done, he declares, we're going to do this. We're going to commit a million dollars to it. And then all the other executives in the room that were disinterested all of a sudden become yes men and uh, talk about what a great idea it is and uh, start nodding their heads and they step in the line, right? So Magnavox is now going to take this brown box and make it into a device. It takes them about eight months to get everything in order, figure out how they're going to do it, set up the manufacturing uh, in Tennessee. Um, while they're working on this, um, Bayer's getting a little worried. He's still at Sanders and Associates, and the company's not doing very well, so he's starting to get a little nervous about his job. Already nervous because TV games has gone nowhere, right? Uh, Magnavox is trying to get this machine priced at $100. They originally wanted it at $25 was Bayer's idea, right? So Magnavox says, how can we manufacture this machine cheaper? Well, they drop the golf game and the putting device. They drop the pumping device. They were at one point talked about four-player support. They dropped four-player support back down to two players, and they removed the color and went back to overlays, right? And then the worst thing of all that makes Ralph Bear cringe, they give it a name, the Skillovision. Yeah, you all are laughing. It's pretty bad. So Ralph has lost total control of the project. Um, and at this time he gets sick. He's in the hospital for hernia surgery. And then Ettlinger and Campman show up to visit him in the hospital. And they bring him a giant, oversized facsimile of a check uh, for $100,000. It was the first payment from Magnavox. So he kind of has a sigh of relief because he can keep his job, right? But uh, obviously, the money doesn't go to him, but the pressure's off and kind of, kind of, kind of reached the end, so to speak. Um, when the product finally makes it out, Ralph is surprised. They get rid of the Skillovision name and call it the Odyssey. You know, and the Odyssey sounds mysterious and futuristic and it kind of brings some adventure. Ralph didn't like it because it didn't actually say what it did. You know, like people don't know what an Odyssey is, but definitely better than Skillovision. Um, and what they come out with, first of all, you've got to love these uh, boxes for the original Odyssey, solid plastic, right? You don't get that anymore, and I get a cheap cardboard box. But they take this brown box, and they make it sleek and modern for the time. It won't look sleek and modern to you. But for the time, ooh, look, it's black and white plastic. It's reminiscent of Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? And it's named Odyssey. Ooh. Get it? Right? So the controllers change a bit. Still have the English. It's just not a separate. It's built into their knob, so it's easier to get to. All right? Now, this is the first game system. People are still playing board games in the evenings, right? So what do you get when you buy your Odyssey? A bag of chips for the gambling game. Play money like Monopoly, right? Possibly the only complete set of Odyssey money in the world right here. It's worthless, totally worthless. <laughs> you get playing cards uh, for a game about states. There's one for all 50 states. You get, you're going to love this, scorekeeper for the sports games with a little paper dial, a cardboard dial you can turn around, right? So it's still very much a board game almost. You got playing cards for the other game. Got more playing cards for another game. Got more playing cards for another game. This is, this is the soccer and the football. You got your 
gambling board for the gambling game. If you flip it over, it's a football field, right? For your football game. You get a manual, of course. You get your state map. You get your stickers, all unused. You have to be impressed that this thing is complete as it is. Just got to point that out. And the game cartridges. Comes with six cartridges, six games. And they plug in. So the idea is still in use today. Well, I guess not in use today because now we're CD-ROM, but in use for decades afterwards. Did any of you ever have, like, do a light bulb for a science project when you're in grade school or middle school? Like, I remember I did a project where it had light bulbs, and then you'd run a wire, and then you'd touch two contacts, and the light would light up. That's how this works. There is no code on these cartridges. Okay, all the games are inside the box. And you put this cartridge in there and it closes certain circuits, which will bring up a certain game, right? But they were thinking, they did gave you six games when you bought it, they held four games back. So after you bought it, you got tired of six games, you could still buy additional games for it. You know, these, this wasn't meant to be a long-term project, right? It's a, a one-year Christmas kind of product. So you get all these crazy things with it. But their marketing wasn't probably where it should have been. They pay a million dollars, and that's a lot of money in 72, to old blue eyes himself, Frank Sinatra, to advertise the Odyssey. Now the demographic market that wants to play these games, they're listening to David Bowie and the Beatles, right? Not, not old blue eyes. And then the public misunderstood how it worked, right? The game machines knew. So the way the commercials were written and some overzealous salesmen, perhaps, people thought the Odyssey only would work on a Magnavox television. Now remember, this is before the days of Best Buy and before Circuit City came and went and Kmart, right? If you wanted to buy a TV, you didn't go to a store and you had 10 different TVs by 10 different companies, right? You went to a Magnavox dealer to look at Magnavox TVs. You went to an RCA dealer to look at RCA TVs. So the only way to buy a Magnavox Odyssey was to get it at the Magnavox dealer, right? No, no retail big, bu big box stores. So when the people go in to buy an Odyssey or look at it, the salesman there gets a commission, right? And he probably got a bigger commission selling a television than he did selling the Odyssey for $100. Because the television was a big buy back then, right? People only had one TV in their house. They didn't come on the back of cereal boxes like they do today, right? <laughs> So, um, so the, the overzealous salesman would sometimes imply that the Odyssey would only work on a Magnavox TV, hoping to sell a TV, so they potentially lost sales of Magnavox game machines. Um, but it sells 350,000 machines in three years, which I consider a success for first time out the door with poor distribution. Um, was it a financial winner? No one knows the numbers for sure. Magnavox has never released them. But Ralph, Ralph Baer thinks it took about $50 to manufacture the device. They spent another million in testing, another million for Sinatra, and then $100,000 royalty checks that came and went to Sanders and Associates. After returns and defectives, he thinks they probably broke even. So not a financial success, but it moved technology along. Um, they did have him working on the Magna Odyssey, which was supposed to be the sequel, which was a 17-inch color television, Magnavox, of course, with an Odyssey built in, and it never, never surfaces. Bear is more than just the inventor of video games. Um, he's done a lot of things. He helped work on the camera, more importantly, the handle of the camera that went to the moon that um, would help send a signal, and it, would, uh, it had to function in extreme heat in the sun portion of the moon, and extreme cold when it was in shadow. Um, he made a device called Smarty Bear. Did any of you ever have a Teddy Ruxpin as a kid? Yep, it's kind of the competitor, stole some of the technology. Uh, Smarty Bear was a little bit smarter. Not only would it talk you know, to the kid, but you could get VHS tapes and play TV shows, and the bear would interact with the show and with the, the kid and the player, all three of them together. Um, he did make some handheld games, like Maniac, right? And uh, he made another game you might be familiar with called Simon. Anybody ever have a Simon? 
Remember the four different colors? Now, the irony is kind of funny with Simon, because remember how Nolan Bushnell kind of stole Pong, the tennis game, and made Pong out of it? I'm sure Ralph wasn't very happy about that. Well, Atari had a game called Touch Me. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not as fun as it sounds. But, um, but basically, Simon is a ripoff of Touch Me. And Touch Me, nobody bought. And Simon was the huge, big Christmas toy when it came out in uh, the late 70s or whatever year that was. Um, he also had an arcade game idea based on ABC's Monday Night Football. We've seen what happened with sports over the years. He had the first electronic gambling game, a casino game of blackjack, and also a horse racing game. And just as these were about to go into production, the uh, uh, mob-run uh, Vegas kind of had something else to say and persuaded the manufacturing people not to go forward with the devices. So uh, things are a little different now. So as you can see, Ralph Baer pioneered a lot of things that are still in use today. He had the idea of using cable for video game delivery, which happened three decades later. Right? He had the idea for sports, uh, a lot of different things. So with that